You may proceed. Good morning, Your Honors. Daniel Russ appearing on behalf of Mr. Burks. This case is here before the court on whether the trial court uh, should have instructed the jury as to second degree criminal, uh, second degree child abuse. I'm sorry, I was in the first case. The Court of Appeals majority opinion found that it was harmless error. However, I would disagree and indicate that uh, the jury was precluded from permitting, from being permitted to decide whether or not Mr. Burks had the sufficient mens rea in order to uh, determine whether he did commit first degree child abuse and then as a result, felony murder. On that basis, uh, I would ask that this court send it back down for a new trial. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Well, is that is that it? You can. That was all question. he had. Pre- oh, any I, oh, can I ask you a question? Okay. Um, Just did. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do, do you mind maybe just kind of elaborating a little bit more as it pertains to harmless error, you know, in terms of the facts of this case? Help me to balance this a little bit. You know, the experts in this case, the physicians in this case, said that the trauma was equivalent to being hit by a truck, if I'm not mistaken. I just want to make sure I'm quoting that correct. Um, and so I really would like you to kind of give us a little bit more of an explanation or a little bit more of an understanding or a little bit more of an appreciation based on the testimony that was presented by the physicians that were called as it pertained to the intensity of the trauma as to why this would be harmless. Well, I don't believe that the uh, testimony from the, the doctors, the forensic pathologist, as well as the emergency room physician went to whether or not Mr. Burks intended to cause the physical harm. If, the, if his testimony, Mr. Burks' testimony was to be believed, he did intentionally do certain acts, but he did not realize what the cause of those actions were going to be. In other words, he may have struck the child in order to get him to respond, but he struck him too hard. There was no intent on Mr. Burks' part in order to cause any harm to his child. Regardless of what the uh, emergency room physician indicated, regardless of what the forensic pathologist testified to. Was I correct? I just want to make sure I'm getting it right. Was I correct that they said that the trauma was equivalent to being hit by a truck? Am I correct on that? Close. I just want to make sure I'm correct. It, it was, yes, it was close. Okay. Um, I believe the testimony was that um, it was a collision. Okay. But, yes. Okay, but I, didn't mean to, I didn't mean to distract you, but I'm just trying to understand if, we, if we're talking about harmless error, you know, please help me to understand how that type of an injury or that kind of an impact in terms of the way the jury instruction was omitted doesn't go to the overall result that the jury reached. What did, by, by the jury not being instructed on the second degree child abuse, they were precluded from deciding whether or not Mr. Burks did, satisfied the requirements of first degree child abuse or whether he intended for his actions to cause physical harm to his child. The judge, the trial court, summarily decided he wasn't believable. His testimony was not believable and believed that the expert's testimony was more believable rather than having the jury decide for themselves whether or not Mr. Burks had the sufficient intent, which I believe under the constitutions of both the state and federal constitutions, the decision on that is up to the jury, not a judge. I have a question about the um, record, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that in the trial court, the defendant asked for the sub B, lesser included, right. but not the sub A. 
And in the Court of Appeals, he did not raise the sub, the, the, one, he, the one he litigated in the trial court. And the Court of Appeals yet, in a published opinion, reaches both. What, 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 what do we do about that? It sort of feels to me like kind of an important issue, um, and one that there hasn't been significant argument, record, or briefing about. Should we care about that? I mean, usually when we want to decide something that's pretty important, we, we want the benefit of like lots of input, good lawyers, help us, even, Certainly. you know. I, I think know. you might be splitting hairs. The, the question is, is whether second, if I understand it correctly, whether uh, second degree child abuse is subsumed by uh, first degree child abuse. Well, I know what the legal question is. Yeah. I'm just asking okay. if on the on a record where one of those questions has never was never even raised by the defendant in the trial court. Before the trial court. And right. the other one um, wasn't raised by the defendant in the Court of Appeals. Then and that's that, yeah, my the, fault. <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I'm not, I didn't mean to, call, I wasn't, I wasn't going to say anything about whose fault it was. I just meant to say, given that there hasn't been any argument on this issue from both sides in the courts that have decided it before us, should that affect what we, you know, how we think about it? I, I sort of feel like this feels important to me and I'd want briefing and input from all sorts of smart people, you know, in case I'm only me medium smart, <coughs> like extra smart. Then I'm the wrong person <laughs> to ask. But however, if I understand your, your question correctly, it, whether the, um, the court Is it was, properly before us? Any of this, any the court was asked specifically for an instruction based on one of several yes. um, second degree ways of, of establishing second degree sexual uh, or, uh, uh, child abuse. It, it is an error for the judge to make a determination necessarily on one ground, even if another ground might have been a proper basis for the instruction. So it, it seems to me that what, what Justice uh, McCormick's question implicates is whether uh, the, the Court of Appeals consideration of the alternate ground that was never presented to the trial judge is an appropriate basis for us to decide this case. Is that a fair question? I, mean, I, 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 I get it. I understand the question. <laughs> Well, I was trying to. Do you want me to no. no, I was trying to. I guess. Work with what you were. Thank you. Posing. I don't think so because I think. So I, as a trial judge, am asked to do, to make a determination on one basis, and I make that determination, and the court of appeals reverses me on a ground that was never presented to me. You think that's a, that's how the system works? No. I, well, I, isn't that what has happened here? Yes, I think if I recall correctly. Defense asked that it be uh, instructed on recklessness. And the court, the trial court, indicated that it was not doing it on recklessness, recklessness but still determined that he, Mr. Burks' testimony was not to be believed, no matter what he said. Well, well, that, well, so I understand that. But, but the, the recklessness is one of several different ways of creating uh, or establishing second degree uh, child abuse. They are not the same. Agreed. Okay. Well, I'm trying to figure out why then we get to the alternate ground that the Court of Appeals decided. My opinion, the Court of Appeals tried overreaching to come up with a decision on affirming the lower court's determination that it wasn't going to instruct on secondary child abuse. <laughs> so in no. your view, so, the, so the, the ground that was presented to the trial court, if I understand the record right, is 3A. The person's omission causes serious physical harm or serious mental harm to a child, or if the person's reckless act causes serious physical harm or serious mental harm to a child. That was what was presented to the trial court. The trial court denied that. The Court of Appeals spoke about another ground. They spoke about B. So it's your position we should just ignore B and just rule on A, even though, is that, is that your position? No, no. You think not. it was, you think we could, have, could we, have, is it your view that we could affirm on B, even though it wasn't presented to the trial court? 
No, I don't want you to. Or fi we could. To I'm sorry. Reverse. We could find reverse on B. We could find for your client on B. Yes. Even though that wasn't presented to the trial court. Yes. Why? Because it, it's part of the second degree child abuse statute. And. Uh, well, yes, but the, don't you have a duty in the trial court to present your theory under? Uh, your theory under which you can prevail on the statute? Yes, and part of, part of the defense theory of the case was that some of these acts were reckless. Yes, that's so, and, and that, Which is why he asked to judge the uh, jury be instructed on second degree child abuse. But that's just because he did not request any other part of the second degree child abuse statute does not foreclose him from arguing that to the jury in his closing arguments, which I believe he did. Once the judge denied the instruction, he had no recourse but to abide by the judge's decision and move on. Okay. Do you want to reserve some time? Please. Good morning, Nicole Matusko on behalf of the Ingham County Prosecutor's Office and the people in this case. I would welcome questions at any time. Um, I believe the point that was just taken is in the trial court, the only instruction that was requested by the defendant was as to child abuse, second degree, a reckless act. Under that theory, uh, it is not a necessarily lesser included of child abuse, first degree. Why? The, uh, the, the intent, the in, for child abuse, first degree, we have an intentional act intending the consequences. Under this theory, we have a reckless act. That's a completely different state of mind than an intentional act. So your view is recklessness is not subsumed within intentional? If you prove the higher intent, the lower intent isn't subsumed with it and also proven? No, Your Honor. I believe it's a different intent, not a... Do you, are you aware that our, our murder jurisprudence, homicide jurisprudence, is inconsistent with your theory? Um, it doesn't reckless, isn't reckless disregard a lesser included of murder one? Your Honor, I believe that it may be a lesser of murder one, but murder can be proved by multiple theor or multiple uh, states of mind. But just the mental uh, intent, it's within that jurisprudence, it, recklessness is subsumed within intentional conduct. I know we're not a model penal code state, but the model penal code explicitly says it's subsumed. What's the argument for why it's different in child abuse and in Michigan from the rest of the world? world. Well, I, just the way recklessness is defined, it's it's disregarding your your what you're doing. It's indifference, in, right? Uh, to, acting to in the, disregard uh, and indifference. How is that different from uh, uh, our homicide uh, reckless? The, the, it's a lesser included of, of murder one, is it not? Uh, you know, I, I honestly am not sure. I mean, we've been explicit in cases like Mendoza and Holtzlag that involuntary manslaughter with a gross negligence mens rea is, in fact, a necessarily lesser included offense of murder with um, a greater malice mens rea. So, Isn't that kind of dispositive of this argument? Uh, yes, Your Honor. If, if gross negligence, if there is case law saying that that is a necessarily state of mind under murder, given that I would say it would be. You wouldn't urge us to have an inconsistent construction of recklessness under the uh, child abuse statute than we have under the uh, homicide provisions, would you? No, Your Honor, I would not urge you to have inconsistent case law on that. Well, what's next then? Um, in this case, when the, the court, when he was asked to do the reckless act, the rec reckless acts were defined by the defense attorney, specifically. Uh, leaving the child alone, which I believe the defense attorney said did not cause any harm. He, he agreed with that. And then the other two reckless acts were leaving the child in the bathtub, and then the third one would be rolling over on top of, of the child. When viewing the two medical experts, the court found that those reckless acts did not cause any harm. Uh, there was no evidence to show that those acts were the cause of the harm for the baby. And that's the grounds in which he didn't instruct the jury. The instruction as to an intentional act, not knowing or not intending the harm, was never requested in the trial court. So we don't believe the trial court erred in not giving the, the reckless instruction because there was no evidence. There was no evidence that those reckless acts actually caused baby Antonio any harm. Sounds like a lot of determining 
credibility issues, doesn't it? I don't believe the trial court said these reckless acts didn't occur. Uh, we don't know about the reckless acts until the defendant testifies. Yeah, but he's making an inference about what the what damage may have ensued if they had occurred, right? Well, the testimony from the two medical experts talked about how um, the, it was blunt force trauma. It wasn't from leaving the baby in the bathtub that that didn't cause the defendant or the the baby any harm. There was no evidence that these these reckless acts caused the baby Antonio any harm. So he didn't disregard and say, I don't believe you, defendant, that those reckless acts may have taken it, it place. It isn't a question of whether he believes it. it the question are the in, what inferences the judge is permitted to make in making a determination that, that there is no reasonable basis in the evidence for the instruction. Isn't that the question that presented to the trial judge? Yes, if there's any uh, rational view of the evidence would support it. Well, in this case, there is no rational view of the evidence that would support that those reckless acts caused any harm to the baby. Okay. If that's wrong, what, what, what's your position? Uh, if if we that's determine that, that that's too intrusive a, a judicial way of making the determination whether there's a rational basis in the evidence to support the instruction, what's your position? Uh, if this court does find it's a lesser included and a rational view of the evidence would have supported so that the trial court erred in giving the instructions, I don't believe, I believe the harmless uh, error test was not met. The defendant cannot show that it's outcome determinative. They were given instructions as to, I believe but it was. But no, but counsel, I have to, I have to ask you on this. Can, Here, you, can you let her oh, I finish? I just want to sure. hear what the. No, please, please, absolutely. Um, instructions as to, for example, manslaughter, so gross negligence. So had they believed that the, for example, the defendant did intentional acts but didn't intend the harm, they could have rejected child abuse first. They could have uh, rejected um, felony murder. And then they would get down to the manslaughter with their, the gross negligence, and they are looking at that mind state where he didn't satisfy the intentional mind state. They were still given gross negligence and that mind state for a um, manslaughter conviction. Just first. Actually, she kind of got to my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? No. Thank you. Anything else? Nothing else. Thank you. The case is submitted. Thank you.